Hello and welcome to Talks with Docents, a series of online programs presented by the Parish Art Museum. I'm Kara Wingfield, Parish Director of Education. Parish docents are a group of dedicated volunteers who lead tours at the museum. They each bring a unique perspective from their years of study and their diverse backgrounds. Our speaker today is Jim Bauer, and his topic is East End Landscapes in the Parish Collection. Jim Bauer has been a docent at the Parish Art Museum for the past seven years since the parish moved to its new building. He has seen the transformation of the East End landscape over the past 28 years that his family has had a home in Watermill, and even earlier when as a child, his family visited the area. Among the recreational activities Jim enjoys are kayaking and sailing on Meacox Bay. In the summer, he and his family try to be locavores, eating vegetables and fruit from the farm adjoining their house and locally caught seafood. So now I'll turn it over to Jim. Good, thank you, Kara. Um, today I'm gonna to focus on um, the, some of the works in the current installation of the permanent collection, which will be up through sometime in 2021. Uh, and uh, what I've done is, is grouped everything, um, or the, the works that I've selected into four categories, landscapes, seascapes, what I call townscapes, um, uh, paintings that, that show aspects of the village would look like. And then a couple of works that are online right now or up in the museum right now uh, that highlight the changing environment on the East End, okay? Um, so why don't we get started? Uh, and the first group of, of works that we're gonna look at and talk about are landscapes. Um, and this is a, a painting from 1883 by George Henry Smiley that's called Farm on Long Island. Um, and I always think back that Prior to the coming of the railroad, which happened to be around 1860 or so, uh, this was primarily an agriculture and agrarian area where uh, seafood and uh, vegetables and dairy products were, uh, were farmed and raised here to basically feed people in the city. It wasn't, as I said, till the railroad came around 1860 that people discovered, hey, this is a really nice place to vacation. Uh, the beaches are great. Um, the, uh, the environment is, you know, the food, the environment is great. Uh, and in fact, it was around that time as well that artists discovered the light out here because of the fact that we're surrounded by water on both sides and, and the landmass is not particularly wide. We get very clear, sharp light. That, that artists obviously like um, to use to paint with. And, and people have likened the light that we have here to, uh, to the light in, in Southern France, again, where, where many artists, French Impressionist artists, as an example, have lived and worked, and artists today still live and work there. So let's look at, at this particular painting. Um, <clears throat> it sort of takes me back to that agrarian period uh, in the 1880s, it's a, you know, a very sort of basic, not a modern day uh, factory farm, but, but a very basic kind of farm. Um, and I'm gonna weave in throughout the talk places that, uh, that I like on the East End or that we frequent. Uh, and for some strange reason, this reminds me of the Iacono chicken farm in East Hampton. Uh, where you can go, where they raise chickens, I, I assume organically and outdoors, uh, and you can go there and buy, you know, totally fresh chickens, you know, whose uh, contemporaries are still running around in, in the field in back of you. Uh, so that's, you know, that's what, what this painting reminds me of. Uh, it, it's sort of interesting in that the sky is relatively dark, most of the and cloudy. Most of the other works that we're going to see um, have crisp, clear, bright sunlight. Okay, we're going to move on now to William Merritt Chase, um, and he, along with two other artists, form the bedrock of 
the parish collection. Um, and Chase lived out here in the 1890s to the early 1900s in the summer when he ran a plein air, in other words, an outdoor painting school in the Shinnecock Hills. And in fact, one of the places that, that I've been to and like to go to uh, is something called Art Village, which is a small colony of houses um, on the west end of Old Montauk Highway. Um, they're now private homes, but that's where the students lived um, when they attended Chase's summer school. And there's also one building that's still almost the studio classroom. But the picture here uh, is, uh, it's called uh, the Big Bayberry Bush, and there's several Bayberry Bush paintings in the collection. Um, but if you look, in that, look at that, um, and, it, and it dates to about 1894, uh, it, it sort of reflects the elegance of the period then, sort of Victorian time. You see um, the three young girls who are his daughters out collecting bayberries in the field, just dressed up in very, you know, sort of starched, clean, white, elegant dresses, collecting the bushes, uh, the, the berries off the bush, rather. And in the back, you see uh, the, the sort of Dutch colonial house that's there, uh, that I, I believe still stands, and that's where um, where Chase lived during that, that particular period. Uh, for the past seven or eight years, uh, we've constantly been talking about bayberries, bayberries. Um, so finally for this uh, talk, I looked up what babies, bayberries are. And in fact, they're these tiny little red berries uh, that you really can't eat. They have a very bitter, sour taste. Uh, so I don't know why the girls are collecting them other than it can be used to create sort of aromatic kinds of, kinds of things. Um, so I learned something about bayberries. Uh, we're we're going to move on to another Chase painting. Um, this is called The Pot Hunter. Um, and you know, it's, it shows a hunter out, uh, you can't see it in, in, um, in this particular picture, but with his rifle um, sort of out in you know, a relatively uh, undeveloped area hunting. Um, the question is, again, what's a pot hunter? Uh, well, learn something here. Uh, by this uh, term or the terminology means uh, going out and hunting a rabbit or a squirrel or something else that could be put in the pot to eat. Um, so that was, you know, sort of, that's a sort of a throwback uh, to uh, a less elegant era when people were, you know, hunting their own food. Although I'm sure that, you know, that exists out here uh, now as well, particularly in deer hunting season. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to, um, to something a little bit more elegant. This is by John Twachman and it's called The Dunes and it dates to about 1910. Um, it's just a very sort of impressionistic, elegant kind of painting with, uh, with the dunes on the left. Uh, and what this reminds me of is uh, there's a, I don't know whether it's a, a national or a local state park, but in Amagansett, um, there's a, something called the Walking Dunes Park or area, uh, where because of the wind, the dunes, they don't actually physically walk like people walk, but the wind continually moves the dunes around, obviously relatively slowly. And you can go out and walk through uh, and among all the dunes that are there in a relatively unpreserved, uh, or preserved rather, uh, environment. Uh, so that's what this in part reminds me of. Most other places nowadays when you see the dunes, there are big signs up in front of them say, you know, don't climb up, don't climb up on the dunes because they protect the environment from erosion or the piping plovers or another protected species is in fact living in the dunes. Uh, but this is, those are the kinds of things that looking at that painting um, brings me back to. Okay. Um, the next artist that we're going to look at is Fairfield Porter, who along with Chase um, is one of the core artists in the collection. Um, Porter lived in Southampton um, he only died around 1974 or so, 
Um, and most of the, or a lot of the paintings that we have of him or that by him uh, have portraits of members of his family, a lot of his wife and, and some of his children uh, and other people. Um, this is more of a landscape. Uh, and when I look at it, there, there are a couple of things that are interesting. First of all, uh, even though it was done in, in 1954, all of a sudden you see the introduction of cars. Uh, the, the car on the left is sort of speeding by. Uh, and when I look at this, even though it's, um, so the title is Calverton, which is a bit further west, it sort of reminds me of the, the more uh, undeveloped area of the North Fork where the route goes through the tiny little towns and the vineyards and, and the farms. Um, so that, that in part is, is what I like about it um, and what it, what it brings back to me. The next painting we're gonna talk about is, um, is uh, Misty Day on the South Fork by Jane Feiliger. Um, and the, we had at the parish about two or three years ago, a great exhibit of entitled The Two Janes by Jane Freilicker and Jane Wilson, uh, both artists who were, were roughly about the same age and lived both in the city as well as out on the East End. Uh, and when I look at this, it in part reminds me or brings back the fog that exists in the, in the East End. And for the most part, um, you think about fog occurring early in the morning uh, when, when you're out driving, uh, or just wake up. Curiously, a couple of days ago, for the first time that, that I've ever noticed, all of a sudden around four o'clock in the afternoon, this incredible fog just descended on the area. Um, and I, I'd never really seen that before. Um, so you know, that was in part a new experience observing uh, you know, what was going on outside our windows. It was actually so dense that I, while I was gonna go somewhere, I said, Ah, it's, you know, it's too dense even to, to think about um, going outside. The next painting is uh, Landscape in Autumn by Sheridan Lord. Uh, and this was done in 1961. Uh, and I look, I mean, a lot of things that I like about this painting. The first is just look at, at the sky, two thirds or perhaps even three quarters of the painting is uh, is occupied by that that crystal clear sky that I talk about, with just like a little uh, whiff of, of clouds coming in. And then, if you look at the horizon line, it's it's perfectly obviously it's horizontal, but but perfectly flat, and it's just offset by a couple of vertical things: the the telephone poles on the horizon line, and then in the fields, just set at an angle. Uh, the lines of the furrows. And what this reminds me of is um, on Daniel's Lane in Sagaponic, there's, uh, there's an open, a large open field. Uh, it's actually right next to the, the famous Ira Renner's house, uh, but a large open field that's totally flat that goes straight down to the ocean. And you get the same kind of very crisp, uh, horizon line there and the same open feeling uh, as, as Sheridan Lord uh, depicted in this particular painting. We're going to move on to, to Alex Katz um, in a painting called Late July. Uh, a couple of things that are interesting about this. One is uh, as I look at the leaves that are there and you think about July, uh, you know, in, at the end of July it gets again really hot. Um, so it can get very hot. So you look at uh, leaves on the trees that are coming out and some are still, some still have their, their green and others for whatever reason um, begin to sort of dry up and drop off. And, and that's what, if, when I look at that, that particular branch, that's what, what brings back to me. Uh, and then looking at, at the water, it's not clear if that's, um, if that's a pond, uh, if that's uh, sort of looking out to the bay, uh, or just because the, the lines, the borders are so regular and straight, 
Could that be even a swimming pool? Moving on to our second Jane painting. Remember we had you know, a Jane Freilicher before. Uh, this is another Jane Freilicher. It's, it's an untitled painting called Landscape. Uh, and what I liked about this is the little ponds on the, in the picture here. Um, the reality is there, there are a large number of small ponds. Some are famous, Sad Pond, for example, or Georgica Pond. Uh, are you know are famous and well known, uh, but sort of spread out throughout the East End, you find other small little ponds, uh, and I really hadn't noticed them much until coming back on a plane. If you fly in from Europe, sometimes and you're sitting on the left side of the plane, uh, you can look down and you can see all of these little ponds uh, on the East End, um, and in fact, you know there there's some right literally in our backyard here um, that, you know, that we've never noticed um, until we became aware of the ponds and, and started looking very carefully for them. The next artist, Robert Dash, um, is, is one of my favorite um, for several reasons. Uh, one, I like the works by themselves. Two, they depict um, places uh, that I know and can relate to. Uh, and third, um, he lived at a, in a house in a garden uh, that's still accessible to the public. It's Madhu Gardens on Sag Main Street. Uh, and it's just beautifully decorated with, uh, with different kinds of ornaments. And again, there's a little pond there in a Japanese garden. Uh, it's just a lovely place to go for, uh, for an hour or two to, to walk around. Um, and it's sort of very interesting. You walk around the different paths and then, you know, the way people design gardens, all of a sudden you turn a corner and see, you know, see a very interesting, interesting kind of site. Uh, so this is, and that's in, uh, in Sagaponic. Uh, the name of this painting obviously is, is Sagaponic. Uh, the next one that Robert Dash uh, that we're including here um, is called Sag Bridge. And if you look on the right, uh, sort of starting from the lower right hand corner coming up, this is the road that goes over the Sag Bridge um, and then continues on going or facing east at this point. Um, I think this is the most beautiful spot uh, in the Hamptons, particularly if you stop on the bridge, you can stop on the bridge, and look to the right where the, the pond opens up and goes down to the ocean, and then look on the left and the pond goes, goes all the way up to, to Montauk Highway and possibly even further. Uh, it's still relatively pres, uh, pristine. There are houses on either side, uh, but it's just beautiful. And one of the things that you can do and that we've done a lot is uh, take your kayaks or paddle boards or whatever, um, just to the far side of this bridge, um, and then you can drop them in and uh, paddle all the way down to the ocean and then back. Uh, and for our family, this is sort of the site of a, a major achievement. Our grandson, who was uh, nine or so, went fishing there last summer um, and caught his first fish. Uh, so we have a picture of him standing on that bridge holding the fish. I would have put it into the, uh, into the slideshow, but that, that was probably going a little bit too far. Um, and the next painting, we're now driving a little bit further east. Um, this is called Sag Meadow. Um, and it's, I think it's on Wayne Scott Main Street. And if you stop there and look uh, south out over the ocean, there's a large open field uh, with some of those ponds that lead down to the ocean. Um, and it's a spot where inevitably, if you're driving by, you see artists standing there painting this scene. Uh, but the other interesting thing is no matter what the time of day is, you can look out into that particular uh, meadow and see deer grazing there. And not just you know, one or two, but large um, groups of deer um, grazing uh, in the meadow there. 
And then the last painting in, in landscape is absolutely my favorite, uh, which is done by April Gornick, uh, who, and it was, was painted in 1983. Um, she lives up in Sag Harbor. Um, and, and this we've had up in the museum uh, quite extensively. Um, it's called Light Before Heat. Um, and when I look at it, there's several things that come to mind. First, when we, we have tours usually with kids, I say, you know, what time of day is this? Okay, can, you know, are there any hints? Um, you know, is this the morning? Is this the evening? And you really can't tell unless you look at the title of Light Before Heat, and you say, oh yeah, it's, it's sometime, you know, just after sunrise when you have these uh, sort of uh, pinkish kinds of, of clouds that come up. And it sort of reminds me from uh, college English, the rosy fingers of dawn from, from I think it was from, from the Odyssey. But in any case, if you look at it, and unfortunately we can't see it that clearly from the uh, picture, if you look at the two rocks in the water before you, there's a line that goes across that shows you know, the, rock, the rocks jutting out of the water and then their reflection below the line, uh, their reflection in the, um, in the water that's there. Um, and this very much reminds me of some of the, the gardens, the rock, the famous rock gardens in Kyoto in Japan. It has that, that sort of that Zen-like stones and that, that, uh, that aura of, of calmness that exists. All right, so we're done with landscapes. Let's move on now to seascapes. Um, and the distinction between land and sea is not necessarily all that, that clear. Uh, the first two that we're gonna look at are done by Mary Moran and, and Thomas Moran, and they're etchings rather than paintings. Uh, the interesting thing, just digressing for a second about the Morans is that the Thomas Moran house has just undergone a restoration uh, and is open to the public. And it's just after you've turned the corner. And, and it's Georgica Pond looking south. Uh, and it, so if you look at it and if you drive on Montauk Highway, there's a little pull off uh, just after there's a, a restaurant there, uh, just after that where you can drop in kayaks and then paddle or paddle boards, whatever, and go all the way down to the ocean. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that there are very nice houses, including lots of sculpture gardens uh, that are facing the pond all the way down Georgica Pond. So you can paddle down and look at all of those gardens and houses that otherwise you could not uh, go in and see. The next etching is by Thomas Moran, uh, her husband, uh, and this is a wreck in Montauk. And if you look out, it's sort of a little bit hard to see, but if you look almost in the center of, of the etching, you can see a ship that has come aground um, on the rocks in Montauk. Uh, and I remember we've done this a couple of times. You go out to the Montauk Lighthouse and then you can climb down the cliffs and sort of walk all the way around among all of those rocks. It, it makes for an interesting kind of excursion. Uh, when you see this etching, just keep it in mind because we're going to come back later in the discussion to something that looks very similar, but from um, almost a hundred years later. The next work is by Winslow Homer, um, and it's called The Trawlers. Um, and you know, you, you, with a couple of exceptions, you don't see people uh, fishing with nets like that anymore. It's all, you know, much larger boats and power and, and uh, much larger nets that they use. Uh, but what this reminds me of is in Meacox Bay uh, in the winter, uh, oyster harvesting is allowed, uh, but only from very small 
boats. So people pull up in their trucks and um, you know, launch their boats and go out and harvest the oysters. Um, what that in part reminds me of is probably about 10 years ago, uh, I wanted to learn more about oyster harvesting. Uh, so I took a course um, in South Hold at the Cornell Extension in basically the process of growing oysters all the way from the, you know, the food that you feed oysters to how you actually then harvest them later on. Um, which leads us to the next painting, uh, which is uh, called Scallop Boats in Peconic Bay. Uh, and again, this is uh, a type of agriculture or fishing uh, that no longer exists, but there were in Peconic Bay uh, flat bottom scallop boats that would go out and harvest the scallops there um, you know, from, from the bottom. Um, it's only now, I think the scallops have suffered um, multiple years of, of devastation by brown tide and red tide and so on. Uh, so part of what the Cornell Extension does is try to uh, repopulate the, the waters of Peconic Bay uh, with, with scallops. The next is um, by Edith Mitchell Krelowitz from 1902. Um, and it's called the entrance to Peconic Bay. Um, and Peconic Bay, we for probably about 15 years or so had a couple of sailboats that we would keep on Peconic Bay. So we would go out and depending on the wind and the tide and everything, um, either sail uh, to Jessup Point uh, or to, to Conscious Point, and then go into, there are a couple of little harbors there go in and explore those little harbors. And that's in part what this, this reminds me of. Um, obviously, this is from 1902. So it's well before um, a lot of houses have been built up uh, around uh, the, the beaches on, on Peconic Bay. The next is um, called the, the Inlet to Woolly Pond. Um, and I selected this uh, in part because I kept my boats uh, on a mooring in Woolly Pond um, and I would have to navigate through <coughs> a very narrow uh, sort of passageway, uh, sort of almost like a canal to get out into the Conic Bay. So it was very exciting going out because on the one side, uh, there, there were actually on both sides in this particular painting, there were uh, sandbars and rocks. And once you got out, you were you know, free into the bay. Uh, the problem coming back was that there were big rocks at the entrance and you would get sort of pushed around. Uh, and fortunately, I never ran into the rocks, uh, but a couple of times I did steer too close to the, the sandbars and then had to either get someone to pull me off the sandbar or the last time um, I had to hop out and physically push the boat off, off the sandbar. So it has both good and bad memories. Uh, the next one is uh, called Frozen Creek. Um, and again, this for me shows the beauty of the East End and the ponds and creeks in the winter when they're, when they're frozen. We've spent a number of um, Christmas Eves and New Year's Eves out here, uh, you know, when the wind is, is sort of howling um, and we're all sort of bundled up with a fireplace in our house and then we'd go down to the beach, um, you know, in the morning and, and take a walk on it. So it's, it's a different kind of, of beauty uh, than we've seen in all of the other paintings to date. The next painting is, or the next work, is by Alfonso Osorio. Um, and Osorio um, was a wealthy um, heir to a Philippine sugar processing factory um, and came here and was both uh, an empresario and friend of artists as well as an artist himself. 
and he owned the Creeks, which is a, a large house um, on, um, on Georgica Pond, um, and would in the 50s and 60s have artists over, or he would provide support to artists who were, you know, um, sort of starving uh, so that they could, you know, they could continue their work. Uh, this work is called Unsuccessful Toe, uh, and it may be hard to see it in, on the video, um, but by toe, uh, the thought is that these are things that, uh, that in towing or uh, using a net to, to try to catch seafood, or, uh, that all sorts of other things come up at the same time. So for the most part, all of the items that he's used in, the, in this particular work are things that you would find at the beach. They're shells, uh, there's a, a wooden piece of, of a piling there, um, you know, other, call it junk, that you would find on the beach, he incorporated into this particular work, okay? And it actually, when, you know, when we have kids in the museum, they all run up to this, this and look at it and, you know, try to identify everything uh, that they can find, sort of like a mini treasure hunt that they can find in the work, okay? We're going to move on now to, to townscapes. Um, and two of the three paintings that we're going to talk about are actually not towns or not representations of places on the East End, uh, but very well could be. Uh, the first is by Child Hassam, and it's, uh, it's a church in, this happens to be in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, but you could very easily, I wouldn't say trick someone, but say to them, oh, this is the church in East Hampton on the main street or the church in Bridgehampton on the main street. Uh, it just, uh, to me, represents a, a sense of, of stability and tranquility. Uh, and typically in these churches, if you walk inside, um, you know, they're relatively simple, uh, bare bones uh, seats and structures and just, you know, exemplifying the beauty of um, the religious service uh, and less focus on a lot of the other uh, fancy ornamentation. Um, the next one is by John Sloan, uh, and Sloan was a member of something called the Ashkent School of Artists uh, that worked around uh, the early years of the 20th century and were depicting the change in um, the environment and lifestyle of, um, of the country, the United States, from, uh, you know, well, totally. Uh, so if we look at this carefully and sort of decompose it, um, it's, you know, it's a small town scene. On the left-hand side, you see the horse and carriage coming that represents uh, sort of the pre-industrial uh, environment. And then you see, you know, the, the car sort of speeding by straight ahead straight ahead. And if you look at it carefully, it's a convertible. It's not necessarily a truck, but it's people um, who are, you know, out for whether it's a Sunday drive or, uh, or vacation. Um, and then moving a bit further to the right, you sort of revert back and you see um, whether it's a goose or a chicken, uh, you know, hanging out in the road. And then on the far right hand side, the two women in, in relatively uh, fancy formal dresses uh, walking back. So it, um, it represents almost a transition in the way people live from, you know, an agrarian kind of an environment to um, a little bit of a, a wealthier environment um, that's exemplified by cars and you know, sort of fancier clothing, okay? The last one in townscapes, uh, and remember I ask you to think about the, the Mary Moran, or uh, you know, the Thomas Moran, sorry, wreck in Montauk. Uh, this could very well be the same location, uh, but this is, it's, the title is the Krieger House, uh, and it's done by Norman Jaffe. Uh, Norman Jaffe was an architect who lived and worked out here and built a number of uh, modern houses uh, that in part reflect 
uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright ethos of, of having the structure or the house fit in with, <clears throat> with the landscape. So if you look at uh, that particular house, which happens to be right in the center, about two thirds of the way up, uh, it totally fits into the rest of the landscape in Montauk with, with the big rocks. Um, there are a lot of houses, a lot of Jaffe mysteriously drowned in, in 2000 and I think it was 2002. Uh, but in 2005, the parish had a great exhibit of, uh, of Jaffe's work. Um, and a lot of his work is um, sort of highlighted in, in books by Paul Goldberger, the, the architecture critic. Okay. We're gonna finish up with two works that are actually both on display in the permanent collection now uh, about the environment. Uh, the first is one of three works that the parish got uh, by David Sally. Um, and this is um, entitled After Michelangelo. Um, and they were commissioned by an Italian uh, museum or an Italian donor to the museum. Um, and what Sally did was uh, picked up themes that appear on the uh, the painting, the Michelangelo painting uh, in, the, in the Sistine Chapel, and then merged them together in this particular one with the environment of Hurricane Katrina. So if you look up on the upper left-hand side, you see um, animals going into, into Noah's Ark. The lower left, you see, well, it's not from the Bible, but um, you see a, a Japanese uh, wood print of a uh, woodcut of a, of a wave. Moving over to the right, other scenes from the, the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And then moving to the center and further right, um, you see a helicopter and a lighthouse from Hurricane uh, Katrina uh, that, that was in, in New Orleans. Uh, you could very easily just fast forward that a couple of years and say, well, this is just like uh, uh, Superstorm Sandy or some of the other hurricanes that have hit and will continue to, uh, to affect people, you know, on, on the East End Long Island and throughout, you know, other coastal areas in the United States. Uh, so this again is now hanging in the museum um, and it's the kind of work that, um, that really benefits from going up to it and studying each of the different pieces uh, in the context of what the overall theme is. The last work that we're going to talk about is by Maya Lin. Uh, and Maya Lin um, came to prominence in, I guess, the uh, early to mid 1970s when she was still a student um, at, at Yale. Um, and she designed the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington uh, a number of years ago in 2018, 2014. Um, the parish, every year or every other year, um, has invites certain artists to come in for platform uh, work. In other words, there are several different areas in the museum that are given to the artists. They come out, um, study the environment on the East End, and then uh, design works that reflect the environment on the East End, as well as the space that, that it exists in the museum for them. So this is in, the, in that first open gallery when you walk into the museum. And actually there were several works at the time. Um, this is um, sort of a map, uh, it's hanging up on the wall, it's, it's relatively large, of Meacox Bay. Um, and it's designed to reflect the, the water uh, that's so much a part of that particular part of, of, of the East End. Um, and sort of all the different tentacles and, fi and fingers that, that, that jut up into the land. Um, she had done another accompanying work that was on the other wall 
um, that had lots of different little, or lots of push pins, if you will, that were into the wall that reflected a map of, uh, of the effect of, of superstorm Sandy. So we've gone from, you know, seascapes all the way through to the environment. Um, I thank you very much for, for joining us today. We hope when the museum reopens that you come in and you'll be able to see the bulk of these, these works on display. Again, thank you.